All right, Alexander, let's talk about the palace intrigue in Kiev. Um, Zelensky trying to fire Zeluzhny, then trying to get Zeluzhny to resign, then offering Zeluzhny a different post in uh, his administration. None of that working. And uh, he has to call in Victoria Newland. <laughs> it seems like he called in Victoria Newland because Zelensky looks really weak, very, very weak for the president the overall commander of everything to, to issue uh, an order to, to fire somebody. And that person getting fired is like, no, <laughs> I'm not leaving. <laughs> so uh, what an incredible um, turn of events. And, uh, and then we have Newland in Kiev and it looks like she's sorted everything out or she's trying to sort things out. Obviously she's freaked out because this is playing very bad in, uh, in the United States. I mean, I can, I can imagine um, Congress, Congress members like uh, like Matt Gates and MTG and Senators J.D. Vance and Rand Paul, they're probably reading these stories, just shaking their heads, going, "You want us to give sixty-one billion to to what's going on at this in this circus? You know, I mean, this is playing out really bad." But um, she she also had to go there to to figure this out because the, the armed forces commander and the president are are uh, about to, to go after each other, so. Um, what do you make of, of everything that's happening in Kiev? What do you make of Victoria's decision, Victoria Newland's uh, decision, which which is it looks like she's going with uh, Zelensky? And uh, some interesting comments from Budanov, who's also an actor in all of this, uh, specifically to uh, to the Telegraph, where he gave a, an interesting interview, and the Economist as well. He also said he's not interested in the job of of commander. So, uh, what do you think of of this palace intrigue going on in yeah. Kiev? I mean, the first thing to say is that we now have final, definite, conclusive, visible, public proof that this palace intrigue, this plotting that we have been talking about for many months on the Duran, and which, uh, you know, mo many people were denying was happening. Well, we now got absolute public, incontrovertible proof that it is indeed happening. Zelensky and Zelensky are not on speaking terms. They obviously loathe each other. Zelensky's been trying to sack Zelensky for months. Uh, apparently, the final decision was made to do so sometime at the end of the uh, last week. He met Zelensky on Monday, told Zelensky, I want you to resign. Zelensky said flatly, no. Now, this is, you know, the commander in chief, Zelensky, talking to a subordinate general, telling that general, I don't have any trust or confidence in you. And the general in an act of complete insubordination, knowing that his commander-in-chief no longer trusts him, says snarkily, I am not going anywhere. I'm staying in post. I mean, if you want to sack me, then just go ahead and try. So, of course, then Zelensky says, look, I am going to sack you. And what he finds is that he can't get anybody to take Zelensky's job. Uh, Budanov, who had been obviously earmark to take over the job at the last moment had cold feet and apparently the other person they they sort of approached who was Sirsky, the ground forces commander who is known not to like Zeluzny he refused also so a, a, a situation of total impasse and as you absolutely rightly say a crisis for Zelensky because what kind of a president what kind of a commander-in-chief is it who's lost confidence in his most senior general, but can't sack him. So this is the kind of situation where um, a president who finds himself like that, who has completely lost power, um, it becomes only a question of time then before he has to step down. Because if he can't control the military, in a war, what does he control? So a massive political crisis, potential political crisis in Kiev. You got the sense over the last couple of hours that, you know, the vultures were circling. Um, Poroshenko, the former president, who clearly resents the fact that Zelensky took over from him and who is a born intriguer and who's been plotting against Zelensky relentlessly for years. Anyway, judging from the statements that various people connected 
to Poroshenko had been making. Poroshenko was waiting to make his move. And as you absolutely rightly say, um, Zelensky hanging by a thread. Victoria Newland sees all of this. and She's the real overall ruler of Ukraine. I mean, I think it's just become absolutely clear now that she's the person who really makes the decisions. She sees all this from a distance. She sees all this from Washington. She's obviously been consulted by Zelensky in advance and is given the green light for the sacking of Zeluzhny. So she sees how this is all playing out in Kiev. And she rushes off to Kiev, probably, as you rightly said, as Zelensky's invitation. And she tells everybody, look, <laughs> the United States, which I speak for, you know, Victoria Nuland speaks for the United States, not the president or the secretary of state or the national security advisor or, uh, you know, the president himself or the vice president, God help us, wherever she is. <laughs> anyway, Victoria Nuland, I speak for the United States. We are supporting Zelensky. And the result is that the crisis is sort of brought under control. And there are reports today that the formal announcement of Zeluzhny's dismissal will be made tomorrow. And the clearest sign that Newland has indeed sorted out the situation is the fact that um, uh, Mikhail Podolyak, who is um, one of Zelensky's advisors, has now given out, given an interview. He said, you know, why is everybody stressing about Zeluzhny? I mean, you know, he's only the overall military chief, sacking him is no big deal. So, I mean, that is clearly a sign that they are indeed going to sack him. And I'm not sure who's going to take his place. We'll probably, presumably, know tomorrow. But again, I guess that um, Newland has been talking to the various interested people. And I strongly suspect, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing it will probably be Budanov after all despite the fact that he got cold feet earlier this week. And we will probably see Budanov in post. And he's giving all these optimistic interviews. He's saying, you know, all is well, you know, uh, uh, the Russian offensive will peter out in the spring. We're going to go back on the counteroffensive in the late spring and early summer. And, you know, the initiative will come back to us. And Newland comes out and says, you know, we've got a big surprise waiting for Putin. He's going to be really shocked by what's coming. So, oh, you know, all this frantic spinning, all sorts of news, supposedly from the battlefronts about how things are suddenly turning out well. You know, they've recaptured some place in Abdevka. They've landed more troops in Krinky. They've delivered new missiles to Ukraine, missiles which were promised a year ago and which most reports suggested had already been delivered some time ago. Anyway, they're saying all of this ma major spinning effort underway in order to prepare the ground, to prepare the Ukrainian people for the announcement tomorrow that Zeluzhny is gone. Um, my thinking on this is that uh, the, the person that they place to take over for Zeluzhny will give us insight as to how the war is going to be run in 2024. What do I mean by that? I mean, if it's Budanov, then you can be certain that they're shifting to some sort of insurgency uh, war because Budanov is not someone who's, who's capable of, of commanding respect from the troops or, or running a, a military operation of this size. I mean, that's obvious. He, he's not trained. He's not educated. He's, this is not what he does. So obviously, if it's Budanov, that must mean that the decision has been taken, that this has to shift over to some sort of, of an insurgency type of, of conflict, uh, whatever that, that, that may mean, all, all the things that that entails. But if they appoint Sirsky, who many people are saying that's, that's the other person that they're thinking about um, to replace Zeluzhny, then it would mean that they are going to, to continue 2024 in much the same way that they have been uh, going about this conflict in 2023, which is a, a conventional war because Sirsky is a military commander and he will be able to um, to command the the forces 
in, in Ukraine. What, what are your thoughts on, on no, that observation? You're, you're absolutely right. I'm sure one of the, 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 the essential reason why Budanov said, I don't want the job, is because he knows he's completely unfit to hold it. I mean, he's never commanded so much as a platoon. <laughs> he's never, this has not been the kind of thing he does. He's a special forces soldier who's got involved in what is called intelligence, but which is really covert, covert operations. I mean, this isn't his style. I mean, it's completely not the kind of war, you know, the ground war that we're seeing being fought in Ukraine now, that he knows how to fight. So you're absolutely correct. If they do put Budanov in place, I mean, he will have two jobs. One is to keep to spy on the generals because clearly they're not trusted. And secondly, to prepare for the insurgency when Ukraine collapses. By contrast, Sirsk is the exact diametric opposite. He's a military commander. He has commanded troops on the battleground. He's more experienced, by the way, than... Um, um, uh, than Zaluzhny is. He's an older man. Unlike uh, Zaluzhny, he trained in the Soviet army. He went through the Soviet military system. Uh, so he's more experienced. He's actually senior in the, in the pre-war hierarchy to Zaluzhny. So you put Sirsky in charge, and that means that you are still planning a conventional war. Now, Sirsky, it must be said, has failed in every single military operation up to now that he's undertaken. But nonetheless, um, if you do want a conventional war, he's a more logical figure than Zaluzhny. And the fact that Zaluzhny and Sirsky don't get on probably will make it easier for Sir Sirsky to take over. Though why Sirsky would want to take over, given the state of the situation on the battlefront, is another matter. Doesn't the amount of money that uh, they're trying to get to Project Ukraine also dictate what type of war they're going to, to fight in 2024 and who they're going to put in charge of the military? I, I imagine, once again, if, if they can't get the $61 billion and the $50 billion from the EU and steal the $300 billion, th then I can imagine that, that they're going to, to say, OK, we have to fall back into some sort of an, an insurgency type of operation. But if they do get all this money then I would imagine they're more comfortable in saying, OK, we can now purchase weapons and, and continue to, to fight the Russians, at least for 2024, in much the same way that we uh, fought them in 2023. Well, this is exactly right. But I mean, I think that the general view now is that they won't be able to get the capital of the Russian frozen assets. They're only going to get the interest, which is nowhere near enough. The uh, funding from the U.S., really does look for the moment to be completely gummed up. And perhaps at some point the funding will come. But already, even if it was authorised today, it would not really make a difference on the battlefronts for many months still. So um, probably they're not expecting very much from that. And the Europeans, by the way, have already scaled down their level of military support to Ukraine. They've now, I think, reduced the amount that they were going to give to Ukraine from 20 billion over four years to just 5 billion in one year with no promise that the remaining 15 billion in weapons will ever come. And this is, of course, because it's now become clear that Europe is struggling to come up with weapons. So um, the funding doesn't seem to be in place so it might be tilting towards a more insurgency type approach. But I also think that at some level, they're now saying to themselves, well, you know, Ukraine isn't really going to be in a position to carry out big, grandiose offensives. It needs to go to the defence. So, you know, if we're going to be fighting on the defence, maybe we don't need some great master strategists to run a defence, in which case... Badanov might be the man, and he can also prepare the ground for the insurgency when the Russians do finally win and take over, which we hope won't be this year. That 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 might be the thing. Right. Yeah, I, I've got a final question for you. Um, if by the time this video goes up, maybe we'll we'll know who's in charge. 
maybe we won't. I don't know. But um, it would be interesting or maybe even a mistake for them to place Budanov as the, the overall commander because, well, for two reasons that I can think of. And I mean a mistake for, for the United States and for Zelensky. Uh, number one is Budanov is someone that he would probably have to fear a lot more than Sirsky as far as being actually in, in charge of all of Ukraine. You know, Sirsky is probably someone who isn't interested in, in running all of Ukraine. Budanov is someone that is absolutely interested in taking over and, and being the main guy in, uh, in all of Ukraine. But the, for the United States, wouldn't it mean that if Budanov is the commander of the Ukraine forces and say he is someone who ends up de facto running uh, the Ukraine state, would that mean that Russia can now actually go after the, the man in charge of all of Ukraine or, or someone very high up in all of Ukraine? Because Budanov is also, if I'm not mistaken, there is um, a, a warrant or, 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 I mean, there's, the Russians have said that he is a terrorist or he has committed terrorist activity and they can go after him. Well, uh, they, I mean, they, they, it's a different yeah. dynamic than, than, than Zeluzhny or, or, or Zelensky oh, once Budanov they, rises to that level. Absolutely. They've already tried to kill him. I mean, you know, they, they, they attack the headquarters of Ukrainian military intelligence. There were lots of reports that um, Budanov was severely wounded um, in that attack and that he had to go off to Germany and uh, receive um, treatment there. Um, in an interview he gave to the Financial Times, they mentioned that he'd broken his back and neck. That must be an exaggeration. People don't survive if their neck, back and neck is broken. But clearly he suffered severe injuries in some event. And quite plausibly, it was this missile attack on his headquarters. So, you know, the Russians are, absolutely have him in their sights. And notice that, you know, he gives interviews from darkened rooms, which suggests that he's, you know, got uh, um, myopia and pain issues and all kinds of things like that. As somebody who suffers myopia, I, I understand why he might want to be in darkened rooms. And that might very well be a product of the fact that, you know, he's been severely wounded um, at some point in the last few months. So absolutely, I mean, Budanov is a, I mean, he makes no sense, actually, if you really want me to say. I mean, he makes absolutely no sense. He's not a person who commands, who has experience in commanding troops. The generals will not want him. They will say, who is this young man? Because he's quite young. I believe he's 37. Who is this young man who's been put in charge of us? He's just a special forces soldier. What does he know about our job? So they won't like it. Um, probably the Ukrainian people won't like it. The Russians will definitely want to come after him, as you absolutely rightly say. And um, on top of all of that, he is dangerous. He's definitely dangerous to Zelensky. And if he does manage to consolidate control of the military, given that he already has a very strong intelligence security apparatus, which has carried out assassinations. This is not controversial. Um, he's exactly the kind of person who might eventually decide to push Zelensky aside and take over everything himself. He's a much more plausible figure to establish himself as some kind of, you know, military ruler of Ukraine, if I have to be honest, than Zeluzhny is. Um, he's much more likely to have that kind of ambition and drive. So, you know, he's a dangerous person to put in charge of the military and an illogical one. And a much more logical person would indeed be Sirsky. And if you really are dreaming of an offensive or restarting an offensive, Sirsky, who is I mean, one thing one must say about him, a very aggressive officer. I mean, he's somebody who has been launching attacks in all kinds of places. They all go wrong, but nonetheless, that's, you know, the kind of thing he does. Um, you know, he's a more logical choice. But we're dealing with people who don't always follow logic, and that's the trouble. And one senses that one of the things about Badanov 
is because he's the military intelligence chief and because the United States is getting so much intelligence from the Ukrainians about the course of the war, he is somebody that some people in the United States probably work with quite regularly. And that might include people like Newland. And that might be why they're attracted to him. All right, we will end it there at the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop, 15% off all t shirts. Take care.